Welcome to Learning Photography with Duck. Here's your host, Duck. Alrighty. Welcome everybody to another edition of Learn Photography with Duck. I am your host, Duck. And uh, I got my sweater on because it's a little chilly in the studio today. I don't know what's going on with this crazy weather. Uh, I was told that uh, Ohio got a little bit of snow. So um, anyway, <clears throat> uh, today is our Q&A. And actually, we should be on the time. Oh, see, look at that. Even I got that wrong. I'm not prepared. Where is it? There we go. Q and A. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> before everybody logged on, I was having problems with uh, with the computer. I was like, "Why is it behaving?" It was like skipping. It wasn't uh, um, uh, the mouse wasn't interacting properly. And then I looked in the corner where they have the notifications. And it says uh, I have to restart in order to to um, um, have the uh, what's it called? You know how how the operating system updates every so often, and it kind of does it in the background. Well, it did it in the background, but in order for it to take effect, you got to restart the the machine. And I hadn't done that. And apparently, guess what? It messes with your system. So anyway. That's taken care of. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. I see Alan, Bob, Larry, Jill, Bill, Alan. Alan with an E and Alan with an A. <laughs> the two Alans are here. All right. And I'm flying off my screen. All right. Today is uh, Q&A. So hopefully you guys have some questions for me. Uh, but before uh, we get into your question and answer. I just wanted to share something. Um, so last week and the week before, I, I kind of went over a few little things um, kind of in the middle of workflow. I don't know if you recall. Oh, I closed. I had to close the program. I did the, um, the photo of the lipstick that I set up on these kind of like white uh, plinths uh, for a photo shoot and I kind of went over different ways of um, doing spot um, spot healing and spot removal and things like that that coupled with the fact that uh, next Saturday I'm going to be doing a photo hunt uh, with Milford photo uh, using I mean using these cards these these uh, challenge cards, prompt cards, all right, and they all have, you know, little challenges that you have to go out and and shoot. It got me thinking about those times when uh, I, I get that mental block. It's like, you know, I'm I'm sitting in the studio, and um, I got all my equipment set up. Uh, I want to do something. I, I don't have a job. So it's not like the job is instructing me that, hey, you got to shoot this. You had to photograph this product or this object. You know, and oftentimes I, I get to the point where I, I want to photograph something, but I don't know what to photograph right now. I'm, I don't know where to start. So it's it's kind of this writer's block type scenario where it's like I want to do something I just don't know what uh, and obviously you know I, I have the photo hunt cards that I can very quickly you know pull something out and, and attempt it but uh, I wasn't in the mood to just go traipsing all over creation for it I wanted to do something you know, that I could do right here with a very simple setup. And, um, <clears throat> but there was, there was no real motivation for me to actually do something uh, until it got to the point where, oh, well, I need to have something for 
you know, Monday night's class. And I said, so let me put, let me whip something together. And then at that point, it was just, oh, let me grab this, let me grab this, let me grab this, slap it together, see what I come up with. And, you know, thinking about that process, there was nothing preventing me from doing that process when I was idle than when I, you know, had a little bit of pressure to create something. Because the, the underlying process of developing an image is the same. The only thing that really was different was the motivation. B previously, I had, there was no pressure on me to create something. I was just searching. So because I was searching, I, I felt that I had kind of this leisure mentality of, well, you know, I can pick and choose. If something, you know, attracts my attention, I'll, I'll go with that. Otherwise, you know what, uh, there's, if I don't come up with something, it's not like anybody's going to complain. All right. So that was the, the underlying thing. And what it comes down to is, self-motivation okay uh i was making excuses for not doing it inwardly even though outwardly i wanted to do something i don't know if that makes any sense it was it's a little weird meta thing go, that was going on in my head you know i i felt i felt the need to create something but I guess the underlying feeling wasn't enough to say, hey, get off your ass and just do it. All right. So what, what I guess what I'm trying to say is if you ever get into that situation where, you know, you want to do something, you know, and just you're not quite motivated. What I find is if you just do it, just jump in. Eventually, what happens is you start that your your mentality switches because this is what happened with me is I, as soon as i said okay i i, I just got to do it all right and i i grabbed a couple of things that i thought would make a good image and i spent a good i don't know half hour 45 minutes just experimenting uh with trying to get a composition that looked somewhat decent okay and along the way, I found that I was creating, like, uh, to quote um, uh, the, uh, the painter Bob Ross, happy little accidents. And that's exactly what happened. You know, as I was moving the lights around, I, I, I said, oh, I kind of like the way this, this uh, is happening here. Or I like the direction this is going in. Uh, or better still, like usually what happens uh, with me is, I don't like this, I need to change it. So basically I was looking for uh, areas that were problems and trying to correct them. But because, you know, I really didn't have a, a preconceived plan, I, uh, I just kind of was experimenting to see what happens. Which got me thinking about just photographing ordinary things, all right? And uh, so I did a quick search. Let me go ahead and switch over to, uh, actually, let me go ahead and um, share my screen. Uh, where's a windowed projector? All right. Uh, actually, you know, before we even do that, we should probably... Uh, let's see. Get my windowed projector going here. Okay. Share. Uh, screen three. Share. All right. How does that look? Does that look okay? Yes. Okay. Very good. Yes. All right. <clears throat> Uh, I got a, a new piece of equipment. I got 
a third um, monitor. It's it's a tiny little one that uh, uh, I'm testing out to see if it works with this. So so you know I don't have to clutter up my big screens and um, what you want to call it. Anyway, switch over to the desktop. So what I did is I just put uh, into Google, I just put in photos of ordinary stuff. All right, photos of ordinary stuff. And the first click or the first uh, entry there is 28 refreshing photos of ordinary uh, things. All right, so I opened it up and it's just, it's a blog post, but it's got these photos all right and i was looking at them and i was like okay well yes they they are very ordinary things but there's something interesting going on in all of these photos now mind you these are not going to be award-winning photos all right because they, they just aren't okay but if you look at it there is uh, there is some thought that is given to the creation of these images. It's not like they, the photographer just pointed the camera to the, um, to the object and took a picture. All right. There's a, a lot of considerations. Like for example, in this first one, there's, there's a consideration for the lighting. Uh, there's a consideration for the angle. All right. He could have taken a, the photo. It's a button. He could have taken a photo of the button straight on to make it look more obvious. All right. But instead, he says, you know what? Let me let me make it so that the viewer has to work a little bit to understand what it is. All right. And of course, a very shallow depth of field. Uh, so it kind of isolates everything. All right. And then once I started looking at these, immediately what came to mind was the presentation I gave a couple months ago on going beyond the rule of thirds, all right? So this, uh, this first image obviously does not apply to rule of thirds. It's not in any one of those rule of thirds position. It's literally dead center, okay? So again, you know, we're not breaking the rule of thirds. We're just substituting another rule for the rule of thirds. And in this case, we're working with a centralized composition. And we have that nice diagonal, all right, um, where we, let me go, where we come into the scene, you know, with this nice open area. Uh, uh, we're introduced to the subject. You know, and then we have this nice diagonal going through the image, right? So there's there's thought being placed to the creation of this image, but it's something that we you know we see every day. It's a button, all right. This next one's uh, uh, playing a little bit more on uh, the abstract. Uh, in this case, it's more about the, the reflection of colors uh, on this metal surface. But again, here we have uh, a very centralized composition, all right? If we were to take it and cut it right down the center, it's literally mirrored on both sides, okay? So it's very symmetrical, all right? But the interesting thing, obviously, is not what it is, but what's being reflected in it, all right? Uh, here's another one. <clears throat> I've actually tried to do this in my past when when I was uh, uh, trying to perfect my digital photography skills and uh, playing around with the different types of lenses. Uh, I set out a fork and just went to town trying to, you know, taking pictures from different angles, seeing if I can create something interesting and come to find out taking a, no, not taking a, anybody can take a photo. Making an interesting photo of a fork is a lot harder than you realize. 
if you ever want to, you know, test your metal, pun intended, try photographing a fork in a unique way. All right. Uh, so here it is. We're working with uh, reflections. We're working with colors. Uh, we're working with showing a unique per perspective on a very common ubiquitous item. All right. This one I thought was pretty cool. All right. Not that the subject is interesting because it, it you know, it's a golf ball, it's a golf ball, it's a golf ball. But it's the way it was presented. Uh, it's the shallow depth of field. It's the uh, use of very selective uh, backlighting. Right, where it's casting, it's literally creating a very natural vignette because the fronts of the foreground balls are all in shadow. There, there, this is all shadow here. Okay, so uh, what's causing the eye to do is move up out of this shadow onto our subject. Okay, and of course, the subject has. Uh, you know, this uh, very unique texture that's literally only found in golf balls. Uh, and it just makes it a little bit more interesting. And, and of course, the lighting on it is a little bit brighter. So our eyes go straight to that. But the thing is, you know, here's another fork uh, using a sliver of depth of field. Okay, you can see how they're focusing just on the ends of the tines and everything else beyond that. Just it's falling off to um, to blur. Uh, a hose on a wet pavement. Oh, here's more silverware. Uh, this is a combination of forks and spoons. Uh, very unique com combination where they're using not just the reflection on the the um, the surface that it's resting on, which is probably like plexiglass or, or even glass, but it's also reflecting in the metal of the spoons. Okay, and again, we have this centralized, uh, very uniform, symmetrical composition, okay? Uh, but we also have uh, the, the rule of thirds. If we look at this horizon line, it's about two thirds down. OK. Uh, so, again, it's just taking something that is common, that it's every day and just seeing what you can make from those items. Uh, this next one, I assume, is some kind of strainer or maybe a couple of strainers, uh, extreme close-up. Uh, here's something uh, a little unique. It's a pine cone. And it looks like they may have even used either Photoshop to create this uh, um, blurred streak effect, or maybe they even just did it in camera by, by zooming in or zooming out. Who knows? A play with uh, uh, bokeh lights in the background. Again, very simple item. Uh, and this one, it's just working with harmonious colors. All right, getting a little creative with something that's very common. All right, a pair of sneakers. Let's just, you know, uh, try to tell a story with something that normally doesn't tell a story. All right, it's not like you can sit down and have a conversation with a pair of sneakers. Right, but here it is, they're trying to convey some kind of story. And again, very simple composition, very minimalist. Uh, this one, uh, this one is also uh, something that is deceptively simple. If you ever want to, again, challenge yourself in how to not only see light, but record light properly with your camera, try taking sunlight going through uh, crystal glass, all right? And in this case, it's probably just regular glass with uh, colored liquid in it, okay? And this one I thought was pretty cool. It's a uh, uh, just five colored pencils 
that are dipped into water and the uh, bubbles are allowed to collect on the outside of the pencil. And what's unique about this is because now it's presenting us a subject in a manner we are normally not uh, used to seeing. We don't normally see pencils dipped in water like this with bubbles clinging to the outside. So uh, it creates a unique perspective to the subject. And of course, uh, the bubbles add a little bit of texture that you know uh, makes the image interesting. And of course, in the background, we have um, probably the, the, um, the bokeh of the light reflecting off background bubbles. All right. Uh, wire rope are around an uh, aglet. Another one with sneakers. All right. Uh, very simple, you, you know, fun composition. Uh, an old timey faucet in a bathroom. Okay. Uh, what makes this one interesting is the fact that they allowed just the faucet handle to stand out in this composition by throwing everything else into blur. All right, again, a, a fairly minimalist uh, presentation. All right. This one, uh, I don't consider this one very strong, just, you know, kind of a little unique. Uh, this one's interesting, a, a play of shadows on a um, uh, on a spring that's rather unique. Okay, another one where we're looking. It's not about the glass, all right. It's it's definitely not about the glass. It's about the shadow cast by the glass. That's what makes this one interesting. Okay, so again, it's just about exploring you know, to see what what you can create out of something that, you know, it just within arm's reach, all right? Can this work without the keyboard there? Oh yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I think in this particular case, I, I don't feel the keyboard adds anything, but, uh, you know, substitute it with um, uh, a, a clean, white marble uh, countertop or even a uh, tabletop and you got the same thing okay a kettle uh, you know this is just a play of light on the steam coming off the kettle that's pretty unique this one another one that's very abstract just colored paper colored paper against a black background. The light is just hitting that front edge of these pages uh, as they're being uh, furled out. Tennis balls, all right. Now this one is uh, again, uh, a little bit more complex than it looks like on the surface, all right. Because on the surface, what do you see? You see tennis balls. But what you're also seeing is the shadow cast by the tennis court net. So it places it into that story frame. So that one, you know, I, I love that image. That's fantastic, very strong image, okay? Uh, pen nib, uh, another uh, abstract one. This looks like uh, maybe it's laser cut wood for some kind of uh, toy or, or, or model or something. Another tea kettle. Uh, not as interesting as the one with the steam coming out because this, let me actually, let me go back to that one. This one indicates movement. We can see movement in the steam coming out of the tea, tea kettle, right? We can even hear the whistle of the tea kettle, all right? So this particular image is very strong because uh, it really pulls from our memory to fill in those things that we, you know, we have, ex we've all experienced tea kettles, all right? But we don't hear it in the image, we hear it in our mind. This other tea kettle, well, it's just kind of sitting there. 
All right. So, you know, in this particular case, it's kind of lacking a little bit of that life. Uh, a play of texture. Uh, I think maybe the lighting could have been a little bit better on that, but it's interesting. Okay. Uh, keyboard, eh, nothing. Another keyboard, eh. Uh, I think it could have allowed for, for greater exploration, you know. But that just goes, yeah, we're at the end. So basically that just kind of, you know, uh, gives you an idea of how you can just take something that's within arm's reach. And so long as you don't, you know, put too much thought into the decision to grab it and use it, you know, thinking, oh, I don't know, it's going to be boring. Oh, I don't know if I'm in the mood to photograph a, a keyboard or, you know, a tea kettle. All right. Instead, if you look at it as a challenge and say, OK, can I make something compelling from this? Can I take it from whatever habitat it's in right now? Maybe it's sitting on, you know, in, in the case of, uh, of the, uh, the tea kettle. All right. Maybe I, I take it from where it's sitting on the edge of the, the stove and I move it into better light. Or maybe I actually put water in it and get some, some steam going out and see if I can get some cross light into it. So rather than just finding something and recording it, you actually manipulate the situation and say, how can I make this more interesting? How can I challenge myself to create something more interesting? How can I challenge myself to see beyond the obvious that is in front of me? Okay. And it's a great extra exercise to fall into every once in a while because what happens is when you're out in the field and maybe you're you're out, like for example, you join me on Saturday and you're you're given a a prompt. All right. Now because you've had experience in really looking at things outside of the box, as they say. You can now take that challenge and you're going to feel a little bit more comfortable with it, knowing that you can probably create something a little bit more interesting that than just a grab shot. OK, or maybe you're looking to make money from your photography and a client says, here, I got this. I got I have this little um, uh, red lipstick thing. I need you to make something creative from it. All right. I don't want you to sh just show me the lipstick. Anybody can do that. I want you to build a story around it. I want you to, you know, give me the wow factor. All right. So anyway, uh, that was what was running through my head. Uh, and I figured I'd share it with you because, you know, sometimes it's nice to be reminded of these things. So anyway, that's uh, that's enough for that. Uh, if you have any questions about anything we discussed, feel free to ask. But, you know, today is Q&A. So if you have something that's hanging you up, uh, whether it's about your camera, whether it's about editing, whether it's about lighting, uh, just we're here to discuss. OK. All right. So with that, I'm going to just stop the share and get back into normal conversation mode. OK. And where's my other screen? There it is. Okay. All right. Who's got questions for me? I'll start. Um, when I use Lightroom, uh, and when I take a photo, first I wash it through DXO. And, okay. And I, and I transfer it back to Lightroom. And then I finish my photo. And then I transfer, so then I, then I transfer that to a folder um, in my computer and just simply by transferring it over it doesn't transfer over the finished product it, fin it transfers over the product prior to finishing it straight out of um, DxO when I go to Lightroom then I fix it but I get the the non-ready you know not, 
not bright, the colors aren't bright, uh, the UI has great depth and little noise, but that's it. Okay, so, all right, so when you, or you take the photo, you bring it into the catalog, right? Right. Uh, and then uh, do you start editing in, in, in Lightroom a little bit? No. You go s straight to DxO? I, I, I download it in Lightroom, and then I put it in a folder, and then I send it to DxO. Do you, send it, do you send it through Lightroom? Uh, through Lightroom. Uh, raw. All right, so so Lightroom's handling the uh, sending it to DxO as as a plugin. You got the plugin, I take it, right? Right. Okay. And then you do whatever you got to do in DxO, and it brings it back into Lightroom. Right. Okay. And then from there, you say you do what? Then then I make my adjustments in Lightroom. In Lightroom, okay. And then I. Then I send it, and then I save it, and then. Well, you can't you can't save in Lightroom. Save there's no saving in Lightroom. Let me. I got my other. In a second. Let's see. Close this. Close this. I got my. Sorry for. Yeah. No. No. It's a. It's all right. Okay. I should so, probably get my zoom in set. There we go. All right. So I have my PC in the background, so I got two computers going there. So now, all right, so I finish my, my subject in, in Lightroom. Okay. And then I go up to the top right where there's four icons, and it says share. And I go to share, and then I go to custom settings. And that's the one I, that's the one I choose to transfer at certain settings. It, it gives me the size and uh, of the photo I want to transfer from from Lightroom. From Lightroom. All right, not not Lightroom Classic. Lightroom just oh. regular Lightroom. Um, regular Lightroom. That's a, that's another thing. Uh, um, maybe I'm using the wrong one. And I, should I be using Lightroom Classic? No, 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 no. That's, that's all right. Uh, so when you share. All right, it gives you what options? Uh, well, I have a custom, custom settings. Okay. Um, so it's it's basically, it's it's your export. Right. Okay. I, I'm exporting it to another folder. Okay. All right, and then from there, uh, so you... I, I send it to another folder. Okay. Uh, to my desktop. Okay. Uh, and then so when I want to transfer to either my photo club or uh, someplace else, uh, when I, or I send it to my sister or friend, it, the photo, for some reason, it, does, it wasn't saved properly. All right. And... It's a real simple system. All right. And so, so what are some of the examples of how it's not saved properly? Um, I, I was just transferring over a photo and I was looking at it before I sent it and I clicked on it and it gave me the, the, the photo that I wanted and a second later it goes back, it just like clicks and it goes right back to the original photo before being finished. Okay. Yeah. Sorry to hit you in with this one. So we're Early. All right, so you're all right. So you open up the folder that you have on your desktop, right? Okay, and you click on it to view it, right? And you said that's the one that does not look like, right? It, it doesn't look like the, fo uh, the photo um, that I originally finished. Hmm. And I, I, unfortunately, I, know, I found out that in a uh, photo contest. So I, I sent it, or not contest, uh, um, we just had a photo club expedition with some photos. And I think I saw 
All right. So, so uh, tell me, like, some of the things that that got changed. Is um, it the the? Uh, did you do any cropping? Oh yeah, uh, cropping. Did it um, keep the cropping? Uh, it did not, uh, because uh, the photo was was when I sent it, it was square. When I got it, it, it was like that. Okay. All right. All right. Whew. Uh, I think this is going to be a stumper. What's that? What are you saving it in? Are you saving it as JPEG or TIFF or? I sent it as original. Um, let's see. I'll I'll tell you here in a second. Let's see. Um, oh. Okay. So when I send it, I want to send it. And I, I'm exporting it, and my choices are original, raw. Oh, that's it. That's it. It's in the name. You're sending the original raw. <laughs> you have to convert it to JPEG. You want to send a JPEG. I want to, I want to send a JPEG. Yeah. After I did all that work, yeah. I don't want to send it in raw i want to send it in jpeg correct <laughs> yeah thanks uh thanks other alan for for jogging my my brain on that one well, we because today, yeah we got we, a, alan one and Al <laughs> oh, we got three. Yo, oh oh well yeah i use it first thing usually the last thing the way it should be <laughs> oh that's funny <laughs> all right but yeah so uh, uh typically what i do actually let me switch over to uh lightroom real quick and share screen share screen all right okay so so typically when you uh export all right so for example uh here is this this image is a tiff file all right i'm i'm actually working on a tiff file all right because i'm i did a lot of compositing over in photoshop okay so now uh this particular tiff file is based on a combination of a couple of raw files. I, you know, I walked you through the the compositing process last week. All right, but even though it's using two raw files, uh, Lightroom understands that it's it's exporting one raw file as the base file. All right, in this case, it's number. Uh, 9175 all right and along with that as a layer on top of it it's sending out another raw file okay and it's converting it to tiff okay so now i have i have two formats going i have the original raw and then i have the tiff file all right nowhere in here is there a jpeg so now if I want to export this, all right, uh, and of course this is, you know, um, uh, Lightroom Classic, but you're gonna have, you're gonna find the same thing, just um, maybe, you know, slight differences in the UI. But I have my exports, all right? And up at the very top, you know, you have, um, the defaults okay and you know so the default may be uh you know send out the original to share the original uh raw file okay that's not what it is that you actually want to do you want to take all that work flatten it into a jpeg but the you need to tell lightroom how big do I make this JPEG? 
All right. What bit depth do I make this JPEG? What color profile do I apply to this JPEG? All right. So this is all information that you need to provide. And typically you do that through the export dialog box. All right. So once you have once you know you're ready to export it or to share it, all right, you need to have Lightroom convert it to the format that you want to share it in. All right, and obviously the more the most considerations are, uh, you know, what format is it? JPEG? Is it PNG? Is it TIFF? Okay, and what size? All right, is it going to be the original size that? Uh, you know, of your working file, or are there very you know specific uh, dimensions that I need to meet? Okay, if there are very specific dimensions, is it going for the screen or is it going for print? Because that'll give you uh, an indication of what your your uh, bit depth is going to be. All right, uh, your DPI. Are, uh, not bit that be your DPI. You know, is it going to be 72 DPI for the screen or is it going to be 300 for print? All right. And then obviously the bit depth, is it going to be 8 bit or 16 bit? Okay. 8 bit for the screen, maybe 16 bit for, for print. All right. Uh, and then what color space? Is it sRGB or am I? you know, uh, sending a specific uh, uh, color profile for a printer. All right. So those are all the criteria that you can build within the export dialog box. And once you have those dialed in, uh, you only need to do it once for each application. All right. So, for example, um, you know, competition at a club. They're going to give you all the specific requirements for your submission of an image. They're going to say it needs to be uh, this dimension, it needs to be this color profile, it needs to be you know uh, this format. Uh, so you plug all those things in, and then you save it as a preset. So the next time you need to you know, generate a, a different image with those criteria, you don't have to go through picking and choosing all those things again. You just go to the preset and kick it out. Okay. So what I'm guessing is that you may not have a bunch of presets already uh, created on your system and you just picked whatever, you know, was there and thinking that that's the one that was going to get you the right results. That's exactly, All right. Exactly yeah. Happened. All right. So uh, I would suggest spend a little time, uh, look for that export. Uh, once you, and it's just, it's actually very simple. All you got to do is start at the top and work your way down. All right. Yeah. Uh, where is it going to be exported? Okay. Uh, I like the idea of the desktop, but just keep in mind, all right, when you start loading up your desktop, it is putting a lot of strain on your, uh, on your memory system, okay, because the computer thinks that everything on your desktop needs to be loaded and ready to go. All right, so I suggest keeping your your desktop clean, okay? Just like if you're working, you know, uh, at work, you want to keep everything off your desktop except the stuff that you really immediately need for that job, okay? So exporting uh, to the desktop is fine because usually after you export, you're going to take it and you're going to, you know, upload it or send it to the printer or whatever it is you need to do with it, you know, which continues the workflow. Once you're completed with that project, I suggest deleting it from your desktop, unless, you know, you need to you know, use it for something else, then maybe move it to something that's not on your desktop.
okay? Uh, so export, and then just go down. Am I going to rename it, all right, for that particular situation? Uh, you know, what's my file settings? It's a JPEG, is it TIFF? Am I exporting to a PSD to share with another, you know, uh, creator, whatever it is, all right? The size, all right? Uh, the, the one thing that I can give uh, uh, as a hint for the size is you have a variety of choices, okay? And typically what I do is I look for the one that says long edge, okay? That's the one I normally go for because I only need to worry about what that long, the, 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 the largest size on the long edge is going to be because whatever crop factor I have, it's going to ca calculate that automatically. All right. So I don't have to, you know, worry about it fitting any particular crop factor uh, by using the long edge, you know, whether I'm, I'm exporting a square or exporting a rectangle, it doesn't matter. It also doesn't matter if I'm exporting in portrait or if I'm exporting in landscape. Whatever the long edge is, that's what it's going to, to do, okay? And then the resolution. Obviously, if it's for the screen, you know, you want like 72 or 96. If it's for print, uh, either whatever the, you know, matches the printer or what I use by default is either 240 or 300, okay? Uh, output sharpening, uh, obviously, uh, you know, you have two choices for print, one for screen, or you can just say, you know, no, no uh, sharpening, okay? Uh, metadata, what kind of metadata you want to keep? Is it going to be watermarked? All right, watermarks you need to kind of set up ahead of time in order to use properly. But you can say, uh, I don't want a watermark, or in this case, I need it, you know, because I'm sharing it online. And then typically, the last one is, is uh, the post processing. What do you want Lightroom to do after it's kicked out that JPEG? Uh, I usually say, you know, show it to me in, in my Explorer window or if you're on a Mac, your Finder window, because typically I'm going to take it from when it exports it, I'm going to take that export and continue my workflow. So by opening it up, it allows me to, to kind of just keep that workflow going. Here's my Finder. Here's my Explorer. There's the file right there. I can now walk it to the printer. I can walk it to Facebook. I can walk it to, you know, my portfolio, wherever it needs to go, okay? And then make sure once ev all these criteria are dialed in, make sure you, cre you click on add, all right? Add that as a preset, create a preset, and then give it a name that really makes sense for that preset. So if it's for competition, at, uh, I'm just going to use, you know, uh, North Haven Camera Club competition has these requirements. So I'm going to give it the name NHCC competition. And that's that way I know every time I click on that preset, it's for that specific purpose. OK, <clears throat> I have one that it, I use for social media. All right, here it is. Social media, 1200 pixels. OK, that tells me uh, this is what I'm going to be using for posting to social media. And it doesn't matter which social media, whether it's going to Facebook or LinkedIn, it's 1200 pixels on the long end and it's going to be watermarked okay so that is a preset all i got to do is click on it and out it goes all right the nice thing that that uh lightroom recently did and i know it's in lightroom cc i'm not sure if it's on regular lightroom or lightroom mobile i'm i'm guessing that they do have it is where you can check there's a little checkbox, and you can have it export 
using multiple profiles all in one shot. So it's not like you have to export the old way. You export, you know, to your social media, come back to your export and export to print, come back to your export dialog box, export to email and whatever. All right. You can do it all in one shot now. Okay. So hopefully that kind of puts you a little bit more on the uh, right track. All right. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right, and and thanks to Alan K for jogging my memory on that one because I was I was head scratching there for a second trying to figure out what it was. So thank you. <laughs> uh, I love it when we work as a team. Okay, uh, other questions? Anybody? This is going to be a very short session and nobody's got questions. I'm just sort of in the middle of stuff, and, you know, with photography, just trying to switch gears on, on, on a couple of things. I, uh, 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 what works with a cell phone doesn't always work with the camera. And if I can, I, I, I won't, if it, those of you who know me are friends with face, friends with face, yeah. <laughs> Facebook friends. Facebook friends. <laughs> uh, that was awesome. That was awesome. Okay. Um, I have new lighting in here, and it's daylight lighting, and down in the living room, it's nice and bright, and it's like, so I took a picture of a plastic flower with my cell phone some time ago, and hey, this works well. So I... Uh, Last week, I, I uh, bought a rose to take a picture, and I have a backboard of grass that's out of focus. So I have a picture of the rose, and behind it, it's grass that looks that's that's out of focus. Um, and the reason why I want to do flower photography this way is I didn't have to worry about lights, shadows. Or wind from outside. So I went to take the picture, and I thought the place had a, uh, the room had a lot of light. The dining area had a lot of light. Well, apparently it doesn't because I had to set the ISO at five thousand. Now, wow. of course, I I could have gotten and I could have got I could have gotten my tripod, and I could have set it up uh, to do a very slow shutter speed. But I didn't want to get that out because I was working on a time constraint. And plus, my problem with a tripod, I feel it doesn't give me the flexibility. Case in point, if I take a picture of a flower of a certain way, look at it, and I go, no, let me do this angle. Boom. No. Hmm. Boom. Yes. I, I, have, I actually have a little trick for you for that. All right. And uh, the the trick is whenever whenever you're doing any kind of exploration, okay, explore with your camera off the tripod. That's off, what I was doing. Yeah. That's what I was doing. Off the tripod. Once you find a once you find a composition that you like, all right, mm -hmm. as you're looking through the viewfinder. Once you find a composition that you like, keep your hand there, all right? And then just look at, at the camera in the space, all right? Okay. And then bring your tripod to the camera. Oh, because I was thinking of the other way around, of setting up the tripod, then doing things. Nah, nah. Because, uh, and... You're not the only one. I, I was that way, too. I, I would explore the scene with the tripod, right? And I very quickly found out that that was very cumbersome and it was very restrictive, all right? And what I ended up happening is I, I, would, I would move the tripod, you know, let me, let me put it here. Let me see what I can get from this angle. Click. Oh, that looks terrible. All right, let me move it here. All right. But 
you're you're dealing with something uh, you're dealing with a piece of machinery that doesn't give you can't work with it organically as if you could with the the tripod off the camera all right you're able to move around all right but like you said you know when you're working with low light you need to ground it on that tripod so uh i don't know one day it just occurred to me it's like duh ex explore the scene you know and then once you find your composition and it, you know there, there's nothing wrong with taking photos handheld even though you're in low light and even though that image is going to look like crap because a wonderful thing though yeah the yeah the, well no no wait, hold on the the thing is all right even though the image is going to look like crap all right because i'm hand holding it it allows me to preview kind of that 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 composition and say okay how can i make this composition stronger before i put any energy into setting up the tripod all right so yeah the image is going to look a little blurry because maybe when i press the shutter you know the the lens moved a little bit but that's not the purpose the nice thing about digital film is that it's cheap okay i can take 10 15 photos handheld that look like crap because the only purpose of those photos is to gain my composition i'm exploring the scene with the camera but with the camera untethered to anything all right so i'm able to work a little bit more organically once i find my composition then i can stop observe it within the space this is okay this is the best angle and then grab the tripod bring it to the camera all right and then now lock it in once i have the the camera on the tripod then i can now start to slow down a little bit more and make sure that my background's nice and clean i can go ahead and and you know clean up the the flower a little bit maybe get rid of you know that leaf that's half uh, half eaten off that you know and just concentrate and now i can make sure that i dial in my proper aperture looking through i can get make sure that my focus is is uh is right okay uh and then concentrate on getting that shot all right so once you get the shot and you're happy with it if you want to explore some more again take it off the tripod to do your exploration and then bring the tripod in when you got the new new setup okay you're going to find that you're going to work a lot faster uh, with a lot less frustration that way thank you because i felt it was taking a lot of my time and uh, i'm just so used to hand holding it's because you can point and go and all that type of stuff. yeah um, but you, you know getting back to you know the discussion earlier you know where you want to just really observe the scene and see what you can make from it. Uh, oftentimes, when you rely on a, a tripod, it forces you to slow down. Whereas if you're just, you know, if you have the comfort of being able to handhold it, but what ends up happening is, you know, we click and we look at it and go, oh, good enough. And then you move on. All right. Where instead you should say, okay, I got this one. Let me see what else I can get. Let me see if I can make something stronger or visually more interesting. Okay. Or, or uh, play around with something a little bit more compelling. All right. Rather than just, okay, I got it. I'm off to the next one. So uh, the, the tripod kind of, grounds you a little bit more and, and makes you uh, forces you to slow down and and think so so the pros and cons to everything well, welcome lee here what surprised me is i don't know yeah. what it is about the cell phone i probably should have checked the settings 
I took a picture of the fake flower, then I took a picture at one point, then I took a picture of the real flower. Then it's like, okay, now let me get my camera. Uh, oh, I have to have this at one fifteenth of a second. That's not going to work. Let me put this up to uh, from 400 ISO to 800 ISO. No, let's try 1200. No. And that was with the... That was with the cell phone camera. No, that was with the uh, with the DSLR. But yeah. With the cell phone camera, it looked good, or unless because I'm looking at it on a small screen with light behind it, of course it's going to look good. Uh, yeah, but but you you got to realize that you're you're working with two different types of of technology. All right. So let let me just make an analogy. <clears throat> Would you drive a car the same way that you would drive a 30-foot camper? Uh, probably not. I never drove a camper, but I get the idea. No, let's say no, I wouldn't. No. Uh, although the fundamentals of both is driving a vehicle. You got, they both have steering wheels. They both have a gas pedal. They both have rear view mirrors, okay? But the form factor is different. One is very compact. The other one's this behemoth, all right? There are, there, you have to take into consideration the form factor of each unit, even though the fundamentals are the same, all right? The lens for a cell phone camera, look at this tiny, tiny, tiny little thing, all right? These lenses are fantastic in low light, all right? Whereas a DSLR with a barrel this long is not, okay? So uh, even though the fundamentals, ISO, aperture, time, are the same, the settings are not going to same because the are not going to be the same because the four factors are different. And the, and the sensors are made up of different materials, they're different sizes, mm -hmm. there's different technology behind each sensor. It, you can't. Right. It's not comparable whatsoever. It, okay. Yeah, so exactly. Use a high, high, use high dynamic ranges so you're going to get a you're going to get a more comp, it's going to be components put together with a DSLR. You're not, you don't have that. Right. Ability. And I think that's what the biggest difference is. The cell phones use that, what they call high dynamic range. Mm -hmm. They use that all the time. And that's where you Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I see what you mean. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, you know, uh, so if you're expecting. If you're expecting the same results from two different machines, it's just not gonna it's not gonna happen, you know. Mario Andretti is not going to win a race driving a school bus, all right, and he should not have any expectation of winning the race while driving a school bus. Okay. So, so you know, uh, just understand the, the different formats. Uh, what each each machine can and cannot do, uh, and play to those uh, strengths and weaknesses. All right, but you you really can't compare the two against each other. No way. Thank you. No problem. All right. Sorry, that that was. That. Still got a mental block with the layers. You put a layer in, then you put something else with it. Is that the way it works? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's see if I can. Ah, give me one second. I have four layers right here. Okay. I have my original layer, okay, and I do this. And I say, okay, <clears throat> on top of this, I want to add something, all right? <clears throat> so what happens is I take 
whatever that something is and I layer it on top. Okay. So let's, let's say, let's say this is my photo. All right. And let's say this is uh, some kind of adjustment layer. All right. Maybe it's a curves adjustment. Okay. And the curves adjustment is going to make my photo darker. So by putting it on top, it's going to make that photo darker underneath. All right. So this, this layer is making this one. Okay. What I'm saying is that once I put a layer on, I have to put an adjustment or some other something added to the layer in order to make the layer work. Is that what it is? Uh, all right. So, so for the curves adjustment, you actually have to, yes, physically make a, an adjustment in order to affect. Add the adjustment layer to the layer. Is that the way it works? Well, this is this is so the adjustment is a layer. All right. So when you when you click on, uh, let me go to desktop. Uh, oh, actually, let me open up Photoshop. <clears throat> Give me one second. Hey, it's just Actually, thanks for the question because I was thinking about it. I was working in layers the other day, but I I think uh, based on the question. You have to reveal the layer on the base layer. Is that right? Uh, well, it depends on. <clears throat> you have to reveal the layer. It depends on what it is that you're trying to do. All right. Can I paint it in? Because well, the thing is, it depends on what the properties of the layer are. In uh, uh, in order to affect the the one below it and above it. So, for example. Uh, let me switch back. Okay. Let's say I'm doing a composite. Okay. And on the composite, I have a photograph of a background, uh, an open field. Okay. And on this photograph, I have a picture of a cow. And I want to take the cow and put it into the field. All right. So I have my background, which is the field. And then I have my layer, which is the, the cow. Okay. Now what happens is when I when I put my my cow layer on top, that cow layer is hiding that field layer. All right. So what I need to do is I need to punch holes in this layer in order for this layer to be visible. Okay. So for that, I have to create a mask, all right? And the masks are applied to the layer, but when we are looking at it in Photoshop, in our layer stack, it actually looks like the mask is here, okay? It looks like this, but in actuality, it's like this, all right? The mask is here, all right? So everything that is white allows this to show through and whatever's uh, black, you know, is there. Okay. So let me, let me go to, where's my Lightroom? Let me go ahead and open this in Photoshop. Uh, edit original. Go to desktop. Okay, so I have, oops, my layers. My adjustments. All right, and then bring this up. Okay. So in this particular case, all right, I have my background, which is uh, just red. Okay. And I have here, let me, uh, oops. And I have here my photograph of the uh, lipstick that I took, right? And you can see that all of this is black, all right? 
it's dark, it, all this is dark. This is all part of the image, okay? The only part that's not is this right here because I extended my uh, canvas, but that's neither here nor there. So what I wanna do is I wanna be able to look through all this stuff. I want all this stuff gone, okay? But because I'm going to work non-destructively, I'm going to use a mask, all right? And I'm going to tell like, uh, Photoshop, hide all this area here, okay? So for that, I create a mask, all right? And the mask looks like this. So everything that's white, it's going to, it's going to keep. Everything that's black, it's going to cut a hole. All right, so now when we go back, all right, we see that red background come through. All right. So that allows us to uh, manipulate our, our stacks. All right, so you can see that if we, if we look here, all right, this layer all right, sits above my um, background layer, okay? So what I have is I have my background layer and then I have my image layer, okay? And uh, so that's, that's with, you know, um, Two layers that actually have content in it okay so the background layer has red it's just a field of red and then the image layer is the lipstick and everything that the camera took so I punched a hole to allow that background to come through all right so now I say okay well let me turn this off okay on this background I don't want it solid red. I actually want to darken the corners in, okay? So for that, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create an adjustment layer, all right? And the adjustment layer is a, um, <clears throat> let me pull this out, uh, is a curves adjustment, all right? And what I did is, uh, when it first comes up, there is no adjustment made to it whatsoever, all right? So when you look at it, it's going to look like nothing has changed because in essence, nothing has, all right? You need to tell it, all right, let's, let's make a change. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to darken the edges, okay? But when I darken it, you notice that it's going to darken everything, everything. Because what it's doing is it's applying that darkening globally on the entire image. Or, I, no, let me rephrase that, on the entire layer, all right? But because the that layer now sits above my background layer, it's affecting everything below it, all right? So everything below is going to get darkened by that layer, okay? But that's okay because I know that by using a mask, I can cut holes in this layer to allow certain things to happen, okay? So let me just put this back here. Oh, come on, there. Ah, uh, doesn't want to sit back in. I understand the concept now. Okay. Okay. We're all set now, Doug. I, under I understand that the layer has to have a function before it to do anything. That was well, understand. Uh, yeah, you have to you have to apply some kind of action to it. Right. All right. That's so. All right. But, right, right. But the thing is, the, the thing is, all right, there is so much flexibility 
All right, that uh, it takes a little getting used to discovering uh, what does what. Okay, so for example, uh, in order for you to be able to see through a layer, you need to punch a hole in it. All right, and this is common to what's called an image layer. All right, an image layer is something that has actual pixels. Okay, where an adjustment layer doesn't have pixels on it. What it's doing is it's affecting all the pixels below it. Okay, and this one is a little tricky because the order of your layers becomes important. All right, because now if I take, uh, all right, so for example, I have here, um, my my adjustment that I made everything darker, okay? But in the layer stack, all right, in my layer stack, here's my background, here's my curves adjustment, and then here's my, my lipstick, all right? Notice how in the layer stack, the lipstick is above the adjustment layer, all right? So that layer will, the, the lipstick layer will not get darkened because it's above it, okay? If for some reason this happened, then everything will get darkened. Everything, everything below is affected by the layer. Correct, all right? And then, not to overcomplicate things, but when you start getting to blend modes, all right? You really have to be careful where you, you put those because it could really, really screw things up, all right? Um, especially like for, for spot removal. When you do spot removal, um, if you remember from uh, last, last week, I did spot removal very, very early on, all right? Because I want all the, all the spots that are being uh, um, erased and gotten rid of I want that at the bottom so any adjustments is going to adjust you know uh, it's going to adjust my original I did all the spot removal all right I want to make sure that anything I put on top of that is going to affect that work I did here okay all right Cool. Uh, Lee, yeah, did that kind of answer your question too, or? Yes. Okay. What is, okay. Same. Properties. Okay. After somebody else asks a question, I, I have another question about flowers, but uh, I don't want to hog it. Let somebody else talk first. Anybody got questions? Otherwise, we'll turn it over to Bill. All yours, Bill. <laughs> okay. As you know, if you remember, I bought the 60 millimeter um, macro lens in order to do flower photography. It was a nice, cheap one. I think I paid $300 for it. I can't afford a $100 macro lens for the amount of times I would be using it. I went to uh, um, a lecture, I, I believe it was, it was a Zoom, I believe it was North Haven Camera Club, and if I, if I, and I think it was. And the person came in and talked about taking pictures of flowers, and he recommended using like an 18 by 20, 200 millimeter lens, because obviously you have to stay, in many cases, when you go to Elizabeth Garden, you have to stay far away from the flower. You can't be trampling on the uh, uh, in front of mm -hmm. it. I have an eighteen by one, uh, an eighteen by what? I have an eighteen by two ninety, I believe, or two eighty camera. And the way this guy talked, he said, "Use that." The difference between that camera and the sixty millimeter is a 60 millimeter can open up to 
Right. I'm taking a picture of a flower with a uh, macro, I'm not going to uh, open up that one anyway. Bread. So, am I better off if I'm going to a place like the Elizabeth Garden? Am I better off taking the 18 by 200 uh, Tamron and, and shooting at uh, f 5.6 or 5.8? Uh, Bill, it depends. Um, I mean, the macro, the macro designation is pretty much indicating that. That lens is capable at some point of a one to one ratio with whatever you're taking. Okay, if you don't need that type of, um, um, <laughs> if you don't need that, I mean, I'm shooting with a 25 to 200 just about everything. I don't care about one to one relationship with my tooler. Yeah. I just want a good picture of a tooler. Yeah, the yeah, as Alan said, the the macro designation just means that you can get a, a lot closer to your subject with the lens. Okay. Um, do do you do you make sauce, spaghetti sauce, Bill? Uh, I take it from a jar and I mix it. <laughs> okay. All right. So you take it from a jar and you mix it. Uh, I like making sauce. My wife makes sauce. Okay. Uh, she uses tomato sauce, you know, crushed tomatoes, uh, salt, pepper, uh, Italian seasonings, and this, that, and the other. All right. She was making it the other day. I walked by. I did the quick sample. And I took a chunk of butter and threw it in. And she looked at me cross-eyed. All right. I let it melt in. And I said, okay, now taste it. And she immediately notice the difference okay that cook cooks different than this cook is either and we cook different than you do is any one of those the correct way would you say you opening up a can is wrong over me cooking it on the stove it's no the final product that counts not the you know yeah, it's a final product, exactly. So, so just because one photographer says you have to do it this way, you know, my opinion, it's bullshit. Okay. What you do need to understand is what is the difference between a 200 millimeter lens and a 16 millimeter lens in relation to your subject? And what is the effect? All right. So a 16 millimeter lens is going to give you a much wider field of view, which allows you to, to really get very close and, and really enhance the center part of the flower as opposed to the edges, okay? And then you have to worry about your background because that 16 millimeter can see everything in the background over there and everything in the background over there and up there and down there okay whereas a 200 millimeter lens is just going to see the flower and what's immediately behind it okay so when you understand the mechanics behind the two lenses it allows you to say okay I want to do this, this, and this with my with this flower. All right. So I'm going to pick the right tools and mix in the right ingredients to get that desired result. All right. It's not that one is better than the other. It's that, you know, if you're going for a very specific taste, you're going to use very specific recipe all right but it's not the only recipe you have other recipes in your bag of tricks because you know that hey you know uh i am at elizabeth park and i and there's a rose back there that i it just it's beautiful i want to get to it but my 16 millimeters is not going to allow me to do it all right so what do you do throw up your hands and give up and say, oh, well, it wasn't meant to be. Or you say, oh, wait, I got to trick up my uh, my tool bag. I'm going to pull out my 200 millimeter lens, put it on, and I'm going to get that shot. 
right? Mm -hmm. Where is where is Bill? If you're going for the center of that uh, orchid, the center of the orchid is, to me anyway, the, the most important picture of the flower. Yeah. And I am going to use a macro lens right on top of it. My 200 millimeter from 50 feet away is not going to get me the inside of that orchid. Right. But if I want a nice picture of that orchid, just a, in a group of orchids, without in regards to the center itself, yeah, I'll use the 200. And I'll, you know, that type of thing. So it all depends, really does all depend on what you're going to, what you want to shoot. Yeah. Like everything else. Yeah. Okay. My, my other, my other concern is, I don't mind changing lenses inside my home. I mind changing outside. I'm concerned. Get over it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Al. I was just going to say. You got to get over it. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. There. Okay. But, but, but to just elaborate on that a little bit. Okay. Let me grab. Let me grab, all right, camera, lens number one, lens number two, okay? You want to, what you want to do is you want to be smart about it, all right? Let me take that off. When you're out in the field, you want to be smart about it, obviously, okay? You're not going to, you know... Uh, take this off and go, ah, la, 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 dust, 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 you know, pollen, pollen, pollen. Look at me. I'm walking around with, you know, an open camera. Just doesn't make any sense. Okay. So what I normally tell people is, you know, at the comfort of your own home, just take some time to practice. Okay. What I normally do is I'll, I'll have a bag with me, or if you if you have maybe you have a little bit of a of, of a wall, you know you're you're walking around the garden and it says oh here's a, a little wall, all right. What you're gonna do is you're gonna get this ready, okay, by loosening up this cap, all right, on the lens you're going to, and you're just gonna put it down, okay, and then the camera. All right, with the camera facing down, you're going to take this off, bring it down, take the cover that's already loose, transfer it over, lift this up, and you're good to go. Just that simple. Okay. All right. And you don't have to worry about anything getting into your camera. All right. Obviously, you don't want to be doing this in the middle of the rain, uh, in the middle of a, you know, a dust storm, you know, uh, common sense, you know, plays plays into it, obviously. But uh, I've gone, I've shot events, uh, you know, in dusty situations where I needed to change a lens. All right. I kind of shield the, the camera with my body. OK. And I do very quickly, uh, a quick change, okay. you know? So, uh, but yeah, Alan's right. You just, you, you have to get over it. Uh, or, don't. Or, or, have, or have two cameras with two different lenses on it. I've thought of it. it. I, got, I do it, that's what I do. Uh, when, yeah, but, when I shoot, of, uh, when I shoot big events, big events, Little events, I'll just bring one camera, one lens, whatever they get, they get, all right? But uh, big events, uh, I've shot off-roading events um, where I walked around with two cameras, all right? The camera, one camera on my shoulder strap with a short lens, which is usually my 2470, mm -hmm. okay? And then on a monopod, with the feet extended so that I can, you know, put the, the uh, stand a monopod next to me, yeah. I'll have my 7200 on that camera, mm -hmm. all right? So I can put that camera down, put my foot on the feet so, so uh, my monopod doesn't fall over, okay? Mm -hmm. Shoot, 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 shoot with my short one. That one goes to my, my waist, 
I pick up the other one, shoot, 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 and then I just walk around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I do that simply because it takes the weight of one camera off my shoulders. But there, I know plenty of photographers that will walk with one camera on one hip, the other camera on the other hip, and they're more than comfortable with that. Okay. But yeah, uh, for casual photography, yeah, that's a little bit overboard, you know, because doing a simple lens swap is, is not a big deal. Okay. Um, and like Alan said, you know, if you get a little dust, eh, you just get the sensor cleaned. All right. It's not that big a deal. Okay. All right, other questions? All righty. P put everything back behind the green screen. <laughs> uh, oh, that's not your real studio, that's a green screen. Oh no, that, that's, my, that's my studio, but it's not behind me. My studio is actually over okay. there, all right? This is, this is my, my green screen da, 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 da. Oh, okay. and I have I have my all my storage here can I show you what I bought let me go downstairs I want to show you something sure like yeah but the way I have my camera set up is I can walk over here actually let me move this camera this way I can walk over here and ta -da, I'm in my studio is that cool all right Oh, goodness. Uh, while we're waiting on Bill, anybody got um, questions? No? I turn the camera on. Maybe I have to adjust the lighting. Let's see. Is the camera on? Yep. There we are. There you go. Okay. Yes. Look at that. Yes. There we are. Sitting in, right. okay. sitting in the dark. I needed a high, new hiking bag. First of all, I wanted a hiking bag. And this fits into photography, by the way. I wanted a hiking bag with a good, solid back because I sweat a lot in the summer. So I don't want to damage the bag with mm -hmm. hiking, and I don't want to damage things in the bag with hiking. In one particular hiking group, I will take my... DSLR because I'm not leading and it comes out with good pictures and they this particular group likes the pictures. Another group that I lead hikes for, I use my cell phone camera because I don't take that many pictures. They don't expect a lot and I can't be a photographer and a hike leader at the same time. Yeah. I don't want to be holding a DSLR and then all of a sudden somebody falls and I have to take time to put the camera away. Yeah. And go deal with a problem. Correct. I just put back in my pocket and take care of things I have to take care of. So I was in Milford Photo the other day, and I saw I saw these camera bags, and I was looking for a hiking bag. So I said to the guy, "Well, show me what you got, you know." And so he said, "Well, this bag, this big bag yep. here, has a spot on the back top." that I can put my camera in and reach in for it quickly. Well, not only did he sell me on it for that reason, but when I have my hiking bag, my camera, my regular hiking bag, my camera's always at the bottom. And if I put the bag down quickly, could damage the camera, mm -hmm. or I have to go through things to get the camera. The camera is here. I don't have to worry about food falling into the camera or whatever so right that was the main reason why i bought that plus the back and yes i can use it as a photography bag or a hiking bag or both because i did not have a bag where i put my tripod in and it doesn't go out the mm -hmm. bag this does the side has a bottom whereas it didn't have a bottom for for tripod i get two tripods a tripod and water I didn't realize it at the time until I saw the instructions afterwards, but 
this part here is, is really, it could be anything, but it was really meant for a laptop. Right. And the main part of the bag, open it from the back, which is the lower. Oh, the other reason why I bought this is my good big bag didn't have a strap over the chest. Oh. So all the weight was on the chest. Yeah, that's a lifesaver when you're hiking. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why I needed a new big bag. My smaller, the interesting thing is my smaller bag had the chest strap, but the big bag didn't. But not only does it have a chest strap, but it has a waist strap. Nice. <laughs> which is like, wow. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> Distributes the weight a little bit more. Yeah, and it makes it, so it's not on my neck. Mm. But here, for this, I have all of these compartments that I can do. Oh, nice. That I want. So I can put my, I can put a lens here. I can put my food here. I can put my first aid kit here. So if somebody's, the bag that I had before, I needed a first aid item. I had to go through everything and get it, whereas now I just open it, go into the shelf to get it, and I can rearrange this, rearrange it. So yes, it's my camera bag and it's my hiking bag. It's about $20 more than I would have spent for a hiking bag, but I wanted it. Yeah. But you... this one, and I cannot remember how much you told me how much each one holds i think uh but there was a thinner one like this and a and a big one like this mm -hmm. the thin one was only twenty dollars less than this so oh yeah yeah for yeah. a lousy 20 bucks yep. i went with yeah. this you you know why they put that that opening panel to the uh to the back why no, it's a safety. It's a safety reason. If that zipper fails, yes. nothing's gonna fall out. Oh, or if I forget to zip. Or if you forget to zip. Oh, uh, that 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 goes back a, a ways where, um, uh, yeah, people have forgotten to zip up their bag, and they grab it and they lift it, and that front facing flap opens up and all their stuff just comes tumbling out not to say that this won't uh if if you forget to zip it and just pick it up but you know the the chances of it going past the shoulder straps and all that uh before you realize it you know it, it just but while you're hiking if that zipper busts for any reason you're not going to be losing your stuff all over the trail so also this has this has four hooks four hooks here so i can put hooks and put other things like uh in the winter time when i hike with my spikes i have my spikes on it yep. the year outside I can do that spikes the horseshoes uh poncho uh you know little blanket roll yeah good stuff awesome temba's good product they really you know have come a long way uh, I remember when Temba first came out, uh, there were a lot of questionable things about him. I just didn't quite get it <laughs> for a photographer. They tried. I don't know the name of the guy who sold this to me. I just went over and looked at him and said, can I help you? And I said, well, yeah. we're looking for a hiking bag. What can you tell me that takes care of both? And he showed me this and the little one. Yeah. And you know what? Your camera goes on the top. And yeah. Like, All right, by itself. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what's smart about that is if you carry liquids, you know, like some hikers will carry a couple bottles of water. If anything happens to those bottles of water, it's not going to drip down onto your camera. Mm -hmm. Yes, because the camera is no longer on the bottom. Correct. Before. Yeah. So even though you have those compartments inside, always make sure you put the your your extra water on the lowermost uh, part of those. Never never above any equipment. So awesome. Uh, you know the one thing I find about carrying bags 
is, you know, when I first bought my first digital camera, it, it came with the, the Canon bag, the typical Canon bag. And I said, oh, this is all I'm ever going to need. No. You know, I, I end up buying bags to fit very specific needs. You know, I, I have a big, you know, backpack. And then when you put stuff in them, they're all too heavy. Don't end the call again. I'm going to show you. Seeing you said lots of bags. Seeing you said lots of bags. I have, uh, yeah, actually, right back here. There we go. There we go. I'll, I'll share it with you. I have, I have bags for lighting equipment. I have more bags for lighting equipment. I have more bags for lighting equipment. I have more bags for lighting equipment down there. And I just bought another one to, to carry my new Godox lights. I have uh, my, my backpack. which is this big monster of a thing. Look at this huge thing, all right? But it, it opens to the front, okay? Uh, but it's got a little access panel. Uh, I have, and I have another one. Let's see if I, if I can find it. I have a little day, day, um, Daytime hike. I don't know where I, where I have it, but I have a little daytime hiking bag. That's that's got one. It's it's a sling bag, and what it does is it it, it travels across instead of over the shoulders like this. It's a single one that goes across, and it allows you to rotate the bag. Uh, from your back to your side, and you have access to the camera from the side. You pull it out, put it back in, and then you just grab the 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 strap and do this, and it puts it on your back. Kind of nice. Sling back. So, but yeah, uh, I'll go to the Goodwill and I'll look my I'll keep my eyes out for uh, uh, you know nice duffel bags. Because you can never have enough. I, I hear him uh, <laughs> rustling okay. about. Okay, I'm back. Now, let me, when I first got into photography, into DSL photography, uh, maybe 12 years ago now, 13 years ago, I saw somebody with a bag like this at the um, mm -hmm. at the Plainville. Somebody in Mid Connecticut had a bag like this where you put your camera in here. Mm -hmm. Let's see, but unfortunately, this hole wasn't big enough for the hood lens. I had to take off the hood lens and put it here, and it was sort of limiting. It did have stuff where I can put accessories in the front and you open this and you put things mm -hmm. here but as you can see you can't store much in this. In fact this is being retired now but I bought the new bag. So for Christmas I asked my son for a gift certificate and I bought like what you said a yeah. sling bag. Oh there you go. Yep. Which is great and, and I have all these compartments here, and I ended up using it for storage. And then when I'm going out in the field, I put my things elsewhere, my actual lenses. You know, here's my, uh, no, it's not wireless. I still have the corded. Uh, yeah, I will always press for the corded shutter release over the wireless ones. It has, it has a lot of space, but as you can see, compared to my new bag, this is bulky. Yeah, yeah. It's not really a hiking bag. This is not a rugged, this is not a, a rugged hiking bag. It's, you can't use it as bulk. And so, yeah, you can use that uh, er, when you go urban hiking. Yeah, however, 
we had a trip to Boston. I mean, Alan and I went with Sue a couple of years ago, but way back then when, when we had Mid Connecticut, we went to Boston. Having lived in Boston, I knew I didn't want to carry a bike mm. like this. So I went out and I bought this little <laughs> which is great for urban photography. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, that's this. that's similar to my other bag, yeah. And this. Oh, here we are. You know, <laughs> and I have to change lenses now. Yep. But as you can see, it's limited to like taking one camera, but it's great for going into an urban area or going to a camera club meetup where you don't want to take right to exactly take. it's okay exactly so this ended up being storage but as i bought more lenses this wasn't enough for my storage so i had to go out <laughs> now what i did on this one oh my gosh this, yeah this cannon bag i saw this bag and um uh, what's that? This what's that? Best Buy. I saw this in Best Buy. Mm -hmm. and I saw it for a certain price. And I thought, well, let me go on Amazon and see what I can buy it for. I bought it from Amazon. So I have more lenses now. This bag for lenses and filters is not enough. <laughs> so I just went out and bought this. Oh goodness! And this little bag and and how do I? How do I know which lens is where? My big lenses are in here. And my prime lenses are in prime lenses. The filters are in here. So and then you still are, walk out of the and Bill, you still walk out of the house with one camera, one lens, and that's it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the hiking bag. I mean, but now after our discussions tonight, I will have two lenses. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and that blower and that blower brush. Yeah, the, the the blower the blower is nice to carry. Yes, the blower is going to the blower is going to go plus my lens cloth and uh, yeah the, the little brush and then my new bag. Now these are just these are just the camera bag or that new one is a combination camera hiking. Downstairs I have the big bag that has that didn't have a a, a chest strap and I have a, a little bag. And then I have another hiking bag that I don't use anymore. And then I have a fanny pack for when I go bike riding. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of bags. Yeah, but they all serve their purpose. Yes. You know, and that's, that's what it is. A, a bag for every season, as they say. Yep. Oh yeah, I I think I don't think I've ever met a uh, serious photographer that didn't have a collection of bags, <laughs> bags, um, tote bags, camera bags, uh, boxes. Yeah, you you need it. Otherwise, you know you're gonna have stuff just pfft, all over the place. I mean, a, as it is, uh, I even have. Let me turn this. I even have bags for my light stands and my backdrop stands. You I know. still have too much stuff everywhere. Yeah. Even with all the bags I got. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know. What's what's tough though is uh, when you have to shoot on location. You know, I have certain, you know, go bags that are, are preset, you know, like uh, my background bag is preset. It's specifically for that. So I just grab that and, and, and go. Um, I have my, my simple strobus kit. Uh, I just grab it and go. But there are times where it's like, oh, I gotta make that checklist and I gotta make sure the bags all have this. And you try to put them, you can't have anything loose when you go on location. Because if you have something loose, it's going to get lost, get left behind, or get broken. You know, so you need to have you need to find a place to have all these things, and then how do you carry it all? All right, I got carts and and uh, um, you know folding carts and you know different sizes. I got you know 
cases that can hold more stuff than they're worth, you know, uh, just to make sure I have everything. And, I and, have a car yeah. down in the garage that was put in the common area where I lived in the condo before here, and I ran, oh, this will be good for uh, for doing event photography, you know, because you put everything in it. But when we uh, when we had Mid Connecticut, a I don't know if you ever came to one of our meetings when we used to hold them at Panera Bread. Ah, uh, yeah, a long time ago. Long yeah, long yeah, 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 yeah. We used to go to Panera Bread. Yeah. And we used to show. I had my second TV was a 32 inch uh, 16 by 9 TV, so I had to bring that and bring the power cord, yep. the uh, the, uh, the ex big extension cord, and maybe a couple of other things. Uh, except for the TV, the other things went into a laundry basket. <laughs> so I walked to the Panera Bread. I walked, that was the only, and I had the checklist yeah. and and the uh, the HDMI cord. So uh, and so the thing is, I, I kept the checklist. I like to have things. This is convenient more than a pad of paper. I put a lot of things on three by five cards. Yep. So I used to put a three by five card in the uh, next to the next to the TV, so I know when to take it. Because I used the laundry basket for other things. I put extension cord, power, yeah. HDMI cord. Otherwise, something gets left behind. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yep. uh, and the other thing, because I didn't want the TV damaged in the car, I put the, uh, the TV, I put a uh, garbage bag over the TV. So mm -hmm. just for those meetings. And, and, of course, oh, I also had a write down to put the laptop. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I remember those days. I sort of miss those. Days. Uh, you know, I do too. They were that fun. Was, that was a fun group. Yeah. It was, it, the, the, problem with, the problem with a meetup group, like these camera clubs charge dues, like $30, $40, uh, even $45 a year, and you pay it. But something like these meetup groups, they're not like the North Haven camera club. No. Uh, you either have to charge this 10 a year or five a year. And so you don't have the money to rent out a hall like North Haven Camera Club and New Haven Camera right. Club do. So you have to depend on a place like a library yep. or a Panera Bread. You got the noise in the Panera Bread and the damn thing with the library. I remember this many years <laughs> ago with the different group. They close at nine. There's no such thing as closing nope. at nine oh five. Any public, no. They they close mm, at that's nine. That's it. You get a nasty letter if you make them yeah. stay late for overtime. Well, so the the reason I liked the Panera meetings was uh, I could uh, order lunch. That was good. That was that was always a plus. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I miss those days. So, all right. A little travel down uh, memory lane. Awesome. That, that's when, uh, uh, Alan, you, you didn't know Sue or me then, especially you didn't know Sue. Uh, Sue O and Sue, Sue F. Sue, me, and Carol. Carol's not here tonight, is she? No. Uh, the three of us started out with point and shoot cameras in the Connecticut Camera Club. Nice. In 2008. I was 2007, the two of them came in in 2008. Yeah. Yep, a lot of lot of good uh, um, events through those those clubs, uh, those groups, I should say. So, all right. Any other questions before we wrap it up? No. All right. Uh, just to remind you, uh, this Thursday is the. Um, studio lighting demo. I'll be demoing it here in the studio. I got uh, a model lined up for that evening. I'll be, actually, let me go to this screen. Uh, this light right here, I don't know if you can tell, that light right there, that's my uh, AD200. I'll be using that and my model and we'll be demonstrating how to set your 
flash so that you get consistent good results. I'm pretty much going to demystify using flash. So if flash is a headache for you and, and or a frustration or a pain point, you know, uh, come and join us on Thursday. And then Saturday, uh, we got almost 30 people signed up. It's awesome. It's going to be a, a great day. And it's supposed to be a great day weather-wise. So I can't wait. I'm looking for, uh, forward to it on Saturday. Um, so if you're not doing anything Saturday and you want to do some fun shooting, just just for the sake of getting out with a group of friends and 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 the camera, come and join us. Okay. Alrighty. Let's uh, actually. I guess I can probably stop sharing here. All right, guys. I really appreciate you coming out and spending the uh, evening with me. Uh, no meeting next week, uh, but we'll next month we'll be back to uh, Lightroom on the first Monday of uh, next month. Okay. Great. All righty, guys. Uh, be safe. Keep shooting, and we'll see you Thank next you. time. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. All right, guys. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you for watching Learning Photography with Duck. Brought to you in association with Milford Photo, your local full service camera store. Located in downtown Milford, Connecticut, Milford Photo offers you a personalized shopping experience. From the latest camera gear to printing and framing services. And, of course, educational workshops to teach you the finer aspects of photography. Don't forget to tell them Duck sent you.